Okay, it is uh, just about time for our last session of the day, but certainly not the least session of the day, because we're going to hear again from Dr. Chuck Severance. Um, again, the very brief bio is he's a professor, publisher, online teacher, and all-around open source contributor, but we know him as the founder of uh, Sakai and our um, Sakai PMC chair. So he is going to tell us all about uh, Sakai Developer School. Dr. Chuck. Thank you, Wilma. Um, let me get the darn button to work. There we go. There we go. Okay, so here is the basic outline. Um, and I, I have the luxury of time now because I thought this was a 20 minute talk and it's a 30 minute talk, but I won't, we won't expand it too much. So this is basically um, me kind of connecting a bit of my Coursera work and Coursera thinking with uh, the problem of onboarding Sakai developers. And so I'll talk a little bit about the historical issues of onboarding Sakai developers, the path to the master programmer, which is my Coursera and online teaching concept, how QA, how important QA is in now, nowadays onboarding new developers, uh, the sort of idea of the developer school and how it turned out and then we got someone that's not muted um and then how it's evolved into mentor meetings um and then um some future thoughts so you know as Wilma said i was the founder of this and one of the things i did in 2004 and 2000 and through 2006 was blew everywhere Everyone was curious about Sakai. Every school wanted to hear what we were going to do. And a lot of those schools became adopters. And what I found uh, in those times was every school would have one or two IT staff members who were super mega developers. And they, they were just waiting for something amazing to happen in their professional life. Because being a super mega IT developer at a college and university IT organization is a safe, secure, but mostly boring job. I mean, nobody needs to comment about that. Anyone listening who's an IT person, but it's not it's not exciting. And I as I would show up, all these people who are super talented with lots of experience, they saw this as a chance for travel and personal development and personal growth and to to go be a hero, right? And so I was adding super senior developers all the time. Every month or so, there'd be one or two super senior developers. They were very talented. Also, they were also very opinionated. They have different ideas on what the right way to build something like Sakai was. And the onboarding was really easy because in, that, in those days, open source, if you were a hotshot in uh, IT at a campus, if I give you an SVN URL and a README, you'd figure it out. You'd, do, you'd read the README. The README didn't even have to be perfect. You know, 24 hours later, sharp senior developers would be up and running. And so it, we never really, in the first three years of the project, thought about onboarding Sakai developers. But over the years... Um, there were people, I think there was some at uh, Arizona State, um, Duke did it for a while, where they would say, wow, you know, there's a, a school that has a professor who's kind of interested in open source, and these computer science departments would have uh, senior projects. And the whole idea was to embed these computer scientists for 15 weeks into something real, like a half class, half internship. Um, and wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great? Then they'll go off into the real world. The problem with that always was, it was always 15 weeks. It was most always in the winter. And these are tired computer science students who have been not getting much sleep for the last three and a half years. And um, they were still taking classes. And then they were interviewing. And these students are supposed to like focus, learn a couple million lines of Java code. And 
because this these classes were always kind of overhyped and overblown, they they wanted to work on an impressive problem. They didn't want to work on, uh, as Sam was talking earlier, a dark mode CSS problem. They wanted to work on, you know, changing how we do analytics and tracking in Sakai and rewriting all the code to use a new analytics profile. It had to be big. It had to be impressive. It had to be loud, right? And so that tended not to work. I was involved in a couple of them and um, we had great ideas and they just couldn't even get started, you know, in even 10 weeks and then they couldn't accomplish something big. So those are pretty frustrating. Um, and you thought, oh, that would have been great to get a bunch of free, because they're talented people, no question. Um, so that was sort of one, and so that that didn't work too much. But then, uh, as I mentioned in my earlier talk, um, 2012 and later, Coursera became a really big part of my life. And online teaching at scale became a big part of my life, <laughs> made possible by learning tools interoperability. And one of the things that I did, because I'm really secretly a frustrated um, theater person, is I created my own reality show called Worldwide Office Hours, where I would, I've gone to about 80 places. If I'm going there for some reason, I'll send email to, you know, 100,000 people and say, why don't you show up at this coffee shop and, uh, and I'll meet you. Sometimes I'm uh, walking around a conference and I'll just be talking to somebody. This was in Japan, 2019. Um, and I'll just be talking and some young person will walk by and say, your voice is familiar. And then they will walk up and say, I'm taking Python from you right now. And, um, and so then I would get a chance to talk to people, whether it be an, a, a thing I organized as a structure or just, just encounter, I mean, I walk around Ann Arbor and people stop me on the street and say, you know, I, I'm in computer science because of you. And so, I mean, I'm like a little tiny celebrity and just because a little tiny corner of the world. Um, and these young people, they all had, and some of them were not young, some were in their 20s and 30s and are like re, restructuring their lives. But the number one question I got was, how do I get a job? And then the first 10 years of, or, well, it's from 2012 through like 2019, I had a, just a stock answer. And I was like, go to meetups. You got to make friends, do whatever. And, and we had a lot of feedback from people that said that by taking a couple of Python courses, their lives had changed. Now, the people whose lives changed were, say, students in bioinformatics that didn't know Python and needed to know Python. And all of a sudden they took a Python class and then they were the greatest bioinformatics person ever. And or uh, they were working at a non-technical job at some company and they learned Python. And so they were the, even though they weren't even a, in a programming role, they were like the first Python programmer in the building. And all of a sudden they get promoted and they're a software development the rest of their lives. And, and that's because the, the time 2012 through 2015 was a weird time in that the marketplace had an extreme expansion of demand for Python programmers and no courses, not the universities weren't providing them. And so my course turned out to be the thing. So it turned out I could do no wrong. And when they said, how do I get a job? My answer was go to meetups. But then COVID happened. And so, you know, I went to my, my last pre-COVID trip was actually to Japan in 2019, where that picture was taken. We had a great time. We had a, a meetup. We did some karaoke. You can go on my little drchuck.com office page and go watch us sing karaoke. And and uh, Shoji was there and filmed it. And so I got some really good stuff. And like, you know, it was exciting. It was before COVID. We had no idea what was about to descend upon us. And then COVID happened. And so um, that just... No, no travel, no nothing, sit at home, write Sakai Plus, <laughs> build C programming for everybody. It was all my, that was my COVID hobby. Um, and so by 2022, I did my first real post COVID trip. I went to Valencia. It was still in the time where you had to go get a test from the government before you get back on a plane when you come home. 
And I, but I just had four students show up at a coffee shop in Valencia. And somehow, so much time had passed. The, the get a job question, they were asking it in a different way, right? Because a lot of these people by then, a lot of these students by then had um, taken every course I've ever taught. And so they had like four or five certificates in Coursera. And now they're looking at me like, hey, how can I get a job? Not like, mm, that's cool Python. How did I get a job? No, they, they like, I took it as you, Chuck, how am I supposed to get a job? So I walked out of there kind of with this, a lot of thinking. And I'm like, wait a sec, if I let my students down. And I came up with the following concept, the concept of the master programmer, which is different than a computer scientist, the master programmer. And, and I asked, I, I, I quickly switched the question from how can I get these people a job at some other place, like an insurance company is like, who would I hire? And if they took all my classes, and by then I had a bunch of classes, would I hire them? And I'm like, no, they're not that great. They're not that useful if they just know those five things, internet, history, Python, Django, PHP, and Postgres. I mean, that doesn't, that's not much value to me. I, I don't, they're not ready to make money at the end of those five classes. And then I asked the question of like, who would I hire? And then I asked the question, like, I would hire me. I like myself. But what made me that? Was it my education that made me that? How did I become a good programmer? And <laughs> all this throughout that question, I was thinking about Sakai. And I was thinking about people in the Sakai community as the people that are some of the most talented and valuable programmers I've ever known in my life. And, um, you know, I, I, okay, I won't say names, but you know who they are. They're the best and brightest among us. And I'm like, you know, maybe eight or nine or 10 in the list of people in Sakai that amaze me. Um, and I look at the people who are in Sakai that are impressed me and that had nothing to do with their education. So that's like scratch, scratch, scratch. What I'm a teacher. I teach college. Education has to be useful for something, but our best programmers, I don't see any evidence that their education is what made them as great as they were. And I struggled and struggled and struggled. And then I kind of realized that a good programmer, the best programmer is about not about what they've already known, what a professor like me has shoved into their brain. It's about their ability to learn new things. Oh, there's a typo there. Ability to learn new things. Sorry about that. It is their ability to learn new things rapidly and deeply and become a wizard at those new things in, let's just say, four weeks. Meaning that the problem is, is this, this world evolves so rapidly. The technology that a person needs to understand to move Sakai forward has never been taught in schools. It, it isn't even taught in schools a year ago, right? Meaning that we're always like grabbing new technology and pulling it in and, and learning and, and, and watching that technology evolve. And so the key thing is not so much that your head was packed full of knowledge when you went to college, but instead, and it's not even what you've learned since you went to college, it's what you're gonna learn in the next three months that's really important. And the people that I have the greatest respect for are the people that walk into a completely confusing area and they pick their way through it. And a few months later, they're an expert and I can go to them for guidance and wisdom. And you can kind of guess who in the Sakai community I'm talking about, right? That I go to for guidance and wisdom not because they learned it in college, but because they figured it out last week. And I'm like, what'd you find? What did you figure out? You're a scout. You went in there, you figured it out. There was no, there was no guidance, no nothing. And so these people are the master programmers that I've got to know over the years through this project. And 
I then asked myself, well, how did I become so good? And I realized that how I became good was not what I was educated in. And it wasn't even my programming experience. It wasn't even the fool around things that I did where I did a, you know, Ruby on Rails um, boot camp or a Ruby on Rails tutorial. None of that mattered. The only thing that mattered to make me good is the mentors I've met over my life. And I can name those people. My first mentor on Sakai was Glenn Golden. I'd never even learned. I'd never used Java one millisecond before I started here and with Sakai. So I didn't know any Java, but Glenn did. And a month later, I was a Java master. I mean, I knew how to program. I knew what a semicolon was. But what I wasn't was um, a Java master. And I've picked up Java really fast, and but every once in a while I get stuck on something. I'm like, Glenn, 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 what's going on here? He would explain it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, and then off I'm running, right? So every once in a while I'd hit a block, and I would just get a hold of Glenn and, Glenn, and he would unblock me. The first thing I ever did in Sakai is DAV, web DAV. I, that was the first project that Glenn gave me, and I just bashed it into Sakai. I was learning Java at the same time. It truly amazes me to hear WebDev mentioned <laughs> in this conference as like a thing. You know, I thought that was going to be dead a long time ago, but that was my first task in 2002. And uh, Glenn helped me through it. And I am skilled in Sakai to the extent that I am because of my mentors and, and other people are now my mentors in so many important areas. And I look to the I mean, I go to the core team meeting and I ask dumb questions and my mentors like straighten me out and help me out. So I started thinking to myself, the most important thing that any programmer needs is a mentor. The problem is that most people hate mentoring. Well, hate is the wrong word. Well, everybody hates wasting their time. The people that have mentored me mentored me because I was ready to learn. I had all the necessary prerequisites. I had all of the skills and experience, so I wasn't going to ask stupid questions like, what's a variable, right? I mean, Glenn, when he was mentoring me, he knew that I knew what a for loop was. I didn't have to like, what's iteration? What's a data structure? You know, I didn't have to ask that. I knew that. I needed to know about Java. So then I started thinking to myself, what would be the perfect curriculum that would prepare someone to be mentored in a new space. Meaning that you need to have enough so that you don't seem incompetent to the person who's willing to mentor you. So I built this, I chose this curriculum. It was kind of my base stuff, internet, Python, Django, PHP, got another request response cycle, SQL, you gotta know what SQL is, and then C programming for everybody and hardware for everybody so you know what the lower level execution models are and why memory management matters and what JVMs, Java virtual machines are, et cetera. JavaScript, of course, is a language that everybody is going to use. Java is a very, a very valuable language to know because you make a lot of money doing it. And then the idea was is to merge that Java into a practical capstone experience with structured mentor. So this is my curriculum. And I'm building these courses. It takes me a long time to build a course. It took me four years to build C programming for everybody. That's the longest I've ever taken building a course. So that's why I want to, once I make a course really good, we talked about templates in the last session. That's why I like templates. Okay. So, but it ends with a capstone practical experience. And so, like I said, C programming for everybody was that the first course that I created that wasn't for beginners. It was like, you better have taken my first, you better have taken Python and you better have rocked your Python because I'm not going to make it easy on you. I'm going to teach you what you need to know. And I'm going to do as good a job as I can as a teacher, but I'm not going to reteach you Python. So if you don't know Python, go back, learn it, learn it well. And if you don't, if you didn't learn it well the first time, then take a Django class because that'll teach you Python. <clears throat> so when I look at this curriculum, Capstone Practical Experience, I had a theory. You'll notice that Java for Everybody is the thing right before. And my theory was the perfect prototype for a Capstone Experience is Sakai. So I take these two threads of thinking. How do you onboard Sakai developers with how do you take people who've taken six courses, graduated, 
and are getting ready to go to work. So developer school was this. And so I recruited 18 months ago. Uh, I was the dean of the developer school. I invented the developer school. And the first professor in the developer school was Adrian. And so if you go here, you go to this video, you can say it's a Kai developer school. You'll find this. It's really just a YouTube channel at this point. There's 36 videos. It's probably 45 hours of stuff. And it is not particularly fast, but it is fascinating. And I got some scripts to help our developers get started, like Windows Subsystem for Linux. About halfway through, I'm like, ah, these Windows people need to, I need to show people how to use Windows Subsystem for Linux because run it on Windows. I know, Matt, you do it on Windows. And I don't like Docker. So I'm so so I, we, we re realized like things like how to get a developer bootstrapped was a big part of it, right? So what I did with Adrian is we just talked. It was two people talking, Adrian and me, just talking back and forth. We spent one to two hours a morning, uh, Wednesday mornings for 18 months, and it's all recorded. And we were going to build this thing called the Pages Tool. And the Pages Tool is like, at this point, probably two thirds done. We used Web Components. We did uh, Sprint Web MVC. We did all the stuff that I consider best practice. Another thing about Sakai, Sakai right now is best practice. We In 2004, you ask four people what the best practice for software development in Sakai, and you get four different answers. Today, I don't think you'd get four different answers. I think we know if we had 100 developers working on Sakai doing new stuff, we would tell them what stack to use. Um, Adrian talked about you, the, the fear of choosing the wrong stack. Well, Java, Java persistence architecture, um, time leaf if you're going to do it in the, in the, in the server rendering, uh, web MVC from Spring um, and uh, web components as the browser framework. I, I think that a lot of people in our community, we like, yup, that's the way to do it. So what we did is in pages is we picked that, that framework, which I think is the, that tech stack, which I think is the future tech stack of Sakai, Sakai and other Java applications. And so we just started writing code and we slowed Adrian down to a crawl. I mean, he probably could have written this stuff in like two weeks, but it took him 18 months to write it. So that's a, Precious piece of data. We <laughs> he refactored web components halfway through it, um, and uh, Shradi and Shivangi were our kind of first students. Mark came to came to them as well, and so we kind of had this we had this audience we were talking to, and and then um, we were recording it for a future audience. So the new onboarding process with this developer school. Um, is again, thinking about how to take someone who just comes out of an educational experience with kind of a lot of pre-knowledge, but not the actual on the job knowledge. And so the first thing we did, which I turned out well, is new people start in quality assurance to learn the product, learn the issue tracker, learn the development project, go to the core meeting, listen to people talking about patches, figure out the kind of what could go wrong in a patch, how things do work and how they eventually things do get done. And so, and it also means that if this is a paid position and uh, all the people involved, almost all the people involved in my developer school are paid by me through the University of Michigan because they're former U of M uh, students usually. Um, and so we're getting work out of them, even if they're not ready to develop. They do QA, did lots of lots in QA. Then what happens is, is at some point, based on their history and their pre-knowledge, they, um, they decide to themselves, that QA is not what they want to do. And they take their first steps into bug fixing and then on and on and on. Now, what I've got is I've got about four people who have been mentored are the, are the new mentors and they're going to mentor the next generation of people. We meet every Wednesday. It's become a mentors meeting at 9.30 a.m. on Zoom. And if you have a developer, we've taken one developer from uh, Marist, uh, Churin, and uh, I can't take 100 but if you got a strong, uh, 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 you know, a, a teaching, uh, a graduate student with a good computer background and they want to come along, welcome to it. We'll start them on QA. I mean, a lot of people do start on QA and that's what Churin from uh, Marist was like, I'm, I want to do more than QA. Like, okay, come Wednesday. 
So um, I got some future ideas going forward on this. Um, I have a dim view of computer science undergraduates willing willingness to engage in real world activity, not because they're bad, but because they're tired. Like I said, the last semester of computer science student is as bad as the first semester or any other semester, and they got to go find a job. But now that I've got a structure that says, look, you come, if all you do is QA for 15 weeks, cool. Right. And so I'm, I'm, because the key thing about the computer science students is they have just tremendous talent. They're just tired. And so I'm trying to figure that out. I'm actually um, thinking about um, bringing in some undergraduates in the, into this developer team, some University of Michigan undergraduates uh, that we have a program where faculty are encouraged to mentor, um, mentor young uh, incoming first generation students and, 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 and help them Make, the tr make a transition into the real world. And I don't pay for that. Someone else pays for that. Um, I might find a computer science project team. I'm more optimistic now than I was before. Thinking back to the teams that I have mentored before, I would, I would make simple rules. And that is like, look, if you aren't going to bring game, then you're going to be doing QA for 15 weeks and that's going to be your final report. Move on with your life. Um, I would love to redo the developer videos, partly because we refactored web components in the middle. It was a great couple of weeks where like, we're learning about the refactoring of web components when it went from empathize to ES build. Um, and I need to make more classes on Coursera so I can graduate those developers. And instead of bringing University of Michigan or other school um, seniors or graduates into the process, I can take Coursera graduates. And what I love about Coursera graduates is it's worldwide. And I can do some of the things, accomplish some of the things I wanna do in terms of educational justice around the world. I would love to get some level of funding. I currently can afford it uh, because of my research money at the University of Michigan. But if this is gonna scale larger and larger, um, I'm gonna, I, I can't just, I, don't, I have a slush fund for now and uh, I'm, and I don't pay much, but they need some level of pay. And so I'm hoping to get like a computer science undergraduate for winter. They Someone else will pay for them through winter, but I might just hire them in the summer, which is really cool because it's likely to be a first generation student. And so now not only they're going to school, computer science, they're getting paid to write software and be part of a team. And I'll just say this, the, the people in Sakai are wonderful. I've never seen a better team. And so we have so much good um, behavior uh, being modeled. Um, and so anyone who would be able to come in and just just lurk at what we do and how we do it, um, like just watching Andrea work is magic. Watching Earl work is magic. Watching Wilma work is magic. They they do an amazing job. Um, and, and Wilma also makes an amazing logo, right? an amazing shirt. I mean, we just, it's the kind of behavior that's being modeled in Sakai is the kind of behavior that these young people uh, need to see. And so um, if you, uh, one of my uh, media appearances that I sit and watch myself, it's like an hour and 20 minutes, like an hour and 18 minutes. It's my best work. <laughs> this guy, David Bomble, he's a Cisco guy but he's also into education and he's also into justice, uh, education justice, as it were. And um, if you watch it, it I, I think it's good. He's, he's, he's good. In, in, and, and I, he brings out kind of all my, all my stories. Um, if you watch it from a Sakai perspective, you'll recognize the people that I'm talking about. <laughs> Cause it's, it really, to me is all about, blending my experience as an online teacher, scale online teacher, and blending my experience in this community. So I, if you have an hour and 20 minutes, it's a fun watch. I encourage you to watch it. The slides, of course, are up on our website on the, on the that Wilma has. And so that's it. And I have another minute. Um, I have been wanting forever to create a sustainable way to extend our community. I feel like I'm on the cusp of that. 
the benefit goes both ways. We benefit from talented software developers who are young and enthusiastic and smarter than me. Um, and then they benefit with getting uh, job readiness. And I mentioned that Atso was in this program and now he has a real job. And I am both ecstatic, happy, and sad at the same time. But that's what life is if you're a teacher and a, and a, and a mentor and a person who wants everyone that you work with to, to be their best selves, right? So this is just a first prototype. I've been prototyping this basically now for two years and everyone who's in it kind of knows that <laughs> this is a work in progress. I got to build out my master curriculum in, in, in Coursera. And then I want to connect Coursera and graduates as Sakai and Sakai. And I want that to be an example for other open source projects. So if I could talk to Drupal and I could talk to um, you know PHP even and say, look, this is the way that you take young people and bring them into your open source project and mentor them and grow them and then lead them to being core contributors, um, you know, in your project as well. And then if I could get this to be like many different projects, then maybe we could go get some, some funding to fund this development of young people. And not only in the United States, but everywhere, right? We got to scale this to the whole world and and make it so that we are impacting people where they live um, in positive ways. So with that, I'll say thank you for listening and uh, thanking all the people who have uh, tolerated the experiment that I call uh, Sakai Developer School. Uh, we have accomplished uh, great things. We have had really solid developers. We have made great progress on accessibility um, because of developer school for the first time, we can have accessibility bugs fixed in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, Mark is going back and we're chasing down old things, but as we go through Sakai 25 and we find new things, um, things won't be old. We have eight or nine year old accessibility bugs that just sit on the back burner. Um, I don't want that to happen because accessibility bugs are a great thing for a wide range of developers to help us with. And so with that, I will pause and uh, see if you have any questions. Yeah, Mark said thanks to Adrian. Well, Adrian was the first professor of the of the Sakai, of the School of Rock, as it were. So yeah, Adrian, uh, it was fun to watch him go. Um, and, and frankly, as a teacher, um, and if you're a teacher and you want to, if you watch that Sakai Developer School, I think it's a powerful form of teaching. The two-person talk show form where you have kind of an expert and then you have kind of the person doing the reflecting on the expert, listening, clarifying, asking for more detail, uh, and being the proxy for the student. I'd say look at Sakai Developer Conference YouTube channel and see what you think is uh, if you think it's a good style of teaching. I the more advanced stuff you teach, the more I think you got to teach it in almost a studio environment rather than a lecture environment where the studio is a bunch of people working together on something. Anything else? Any other questions? I am looking at the chat. Okay, well, Wilma, I I used up my extra time. It was yeah. a more, it was a more relaxed and very much more enjoyable for me because I could like <laughs> take your time and not rush. Yeah, yeah, I could tell stories, and <laughs> you know me, I, I do like to tell stories. Um, and so that that was fun, and uh, and thank you uh, for letting me talk. Well, thank you for sharing all of that with us, and I think it's really a success story because we have seen. Um, a lot of the folks that are participating in this, you know, being more involved on the core calls and fixing bugs. And, you know, it's really exciting to see new new blood in the developer pool. So um, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's just like it's like free money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, whoa, and that, that got fixed and it didn't take the standard people, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's taken some time, uh, but then at some point the uh, the cost benefit sort of flips. And you are benefiting more than you're costing. And, and frankly, the next semester for this is going to really tell the tale 
Uh, I don't see too many people. I see Adrian and and, and Mark, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hire a brand new person, a master student. I think I'm gonna get a couple undergraduates, and I'm just gonna throw them into the deep end and see if the mentors can make the. I mean, the people that were being mentored a year ago can then become the mentors because then. I'm back to being lazy, right? I'm I'm back to just kind of smiling and waving and bringing people in and they teach each other stuff. I mean, you know, Mark Mark knows me well enough to know how I do stuff. I <laughs> I get it all working and then I kind of run away and go back and work on code like Common Cartridge 2.0 <laughs> or Sakai Plus or something like that. So it, it needs to be uh, self-sustaining when it's all said and done. I mean, I it can't be like Chuck forces it to happen. It's got to be a natural occurrence that just keeps happening. I call it the breeder reactor where, you know, it's creating new talent is just kind of almost a side effect of the current thing working. That's a great way to look at it. And it does kind of perpetuate itself if it, if it works. So, so that's great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Chuck, for sharing all that. Um, about developer school. And for those of you interested, you can check out that YouTube channel and uh, and see what it's all about. Um, or if you have um, students that you'd like to introduce to the, the mentoring pro progress, um, you know, just hook them up with Dr. Chuck and his crew, and I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll learn a lot.